characterized by complexity, and they tend to have poorer outcomes and higher costs of care. And so that's important, not only for the individuals, but for the agencies and the insurance companies who are paying for treatment. If you notice, cognitive and learning issues is one of the issues that doctors Klein and Minkoff include in this complexity that they're talking about. And in my experience up until recently, I really haven't heard that be included in the possible realms of problems or issues that people might have. You know, housing, parenting, educational, vocational, legal, those are all really common problems. But I was really happy when I saw this that they're including cognitive and learning issues. Similarly, with the recent trend in cultural competence, cultural identities, and intersectionality, we have a whole range of different aspects of people's lives. And some of them are more familiar maybe than others. But once again, you have ability listed as one of those cultural identities. And that could be talking about lots of different forms of ability. You know, it could be talking about physical ability or, or cognitive. So it's, it's refreshing. I've been working in this field for many, many years, and it's only been in the past maybe two years that I've really started to see ability or cognitive issues being addressed as an issue that, that needs focus and needs attention. So I, as I said, I will um, follow up with those other two areas when we get to them later on in the presentation. So uh, can anyone take a stab at what 31% might be referring to? If you read my, the, the description of this presentation, you might have noticed some statistics that were given. I'll just, since I can't hear you or see you, I'm just going to move ahead and say 31% is the prevalence of cognitive impairment that was found in just one study among participants who are seeking treatment for substance use disorder. And the research shows that prevalence rates vary wildly from 30 to 80 percent due to all sorts of different factors, age, length and severity of use, substances used, uh, and age at onset of use. So I wonder if anyone has a sense of how that compares to other groups or just the general population. Like how many people do you think, what percentage do you think of the general population have cognitive challenges? So, Julia, if you'd like them to respond to your questions, um, they can, Everybody can use the chat box if you'd like to um, chime in to the conversation. Um, sure. And yeah, I can, there... I, I'd be happy to read some answers off if you'd like or okay. use it however you want. Yeah, that'd be fine. I just, uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Okay, uh, sure. I see Diane said, I think 15%. So okay. that was interesting. Um, so the research that I did found that people with intellectual disabilities make up 1% of the general population, just 1%. People living with long-term disability from traumatic brain injury, 1.7%. And this is sort of a subcategory. It's older adults without dementia who have mild cognitive impairment ranges anywhere from 1.8 to 7.2 percent depending on which specific cognitive skill they're testing for so 
the from 1% to 7.2%, which is not even the general population, have issues with cognitive challenges. Lisa apparently has a question or has raised a hand. Maybe you could put something in the chat box, Lisa. So I just wanted to give you a little visual on what this looks like. So if you remember that the older adults, that's not the whole population, right? So 7.2% of older adults, but otherwise we're looking at the general population, people with intellectual disabilities, people with traumatic brain injuries, and mild cognitive impairment compared to, this is the low end, the 31% of people with SUDs who have some level of cognitive impairment. That's, that's a huge, um, that's a huge, sorry, the, the chat box is flashing on my screen and it distracted me for a moment. Anyway, it's a very large percentage, as you can see. Now, last couple of things I want to touch on are just sort of semantics. You'll notice in the slides, I use the abbreviation CI for cognitive impairment. But often when I speak, I talk about cognitive challenges. And I just want to clarify how and why I use those the way I do. Cognitive impairment is a clinical term. It's used in professional literature related to medical conditions, psychological disorders, substance use disorders. So it's, it's, it's more of a scientific or a clinical term. Cognitive challenges is more of a descriptive term or even the word, uh, the term cognitive differences. Those are more descriptive terms that are more inclusive and they're less diagnostic but they're more functional. So when I'm looking at a person who's coming into treatment and they seem to be having some challenges engaging in treatment or understanding what's happening in group or their homework assignments, I'm looking at some cognitive challenges as opposed to a known cognitive impairment. Uh, so that's just the way I look at it. However, the abbreviation CI is nice and brief and easily recognizable. Whereas if I were to use CC for cognitive challenges, that might not be as clear. So you'll see on the slides that I frequently refer to CI and it's just an abbreviation for either cognitive impairment or cognitive challenges. So. I hope that's clear to everybody. Now, I think you did these polls just before we started. Uh, have you ever worked with an individual with a known cognitive oh, impairment? I can launch, I launched that one too early. I can put that up again. So folks who might've joined us since then. Oh, okay. I will open those okay. right now. Sorry about that. Okay, no, that's all right. Um, here we go. There we go. So I know somebody didn't get to uh, answer these, so now you get a chance. And uh, that second question is, oh, it's not gonna work. I can't advance when the polls are there. There you go. The second one is asking, have you ever worked with someone without a formal diagnosis, but who appeared to have challenges with issues like learning, remembering, applying, understanding, those sorts of things, so. All right, we'll give that just a few more seconds here. Okay. Looks like everybody has responded. And we can share those results now. Great. All right. Can you see those? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Great. So there's there's well over, I would say over half, almost two thirds. Uh, I'm not very good with math, by the way. Uh, looks like about two thirds of the group that have some experience working with people either with diagnosed cognitive challenges or suspected cognitive challenges. So that's good. And for those of you who aren't sure or have never worked with someone, um, it's it's uh, it's okay. You know, uh, part of part of the whole purpose of having this webinar is so that people start to understand that being a substance use disorder counselor uh, means, you know, that chances are you're going to treat someone who has these challenges. And if you don't even know that that possibility exists, you may not realize why that person might be struggling or might appear to be unmotivated or resistant. I don't know how many of you have been in the field a long time, but that used to be the way we described people, you know, oh, they're treatment resistant. So uh, it, it it's important to kind of look at your clients that you're working with from a more open pers perspective and consider that maybe some of the some of the behavior or lack of progress or you know lack of engagement that you're seeing might be related to some cognitive challenges that the person is struggling with that maybe they're not even aware of you know and especially in early recovery when you're you know how it takes a good year or so for people to uh people to you know clear up from their substance use and in that first year they can have a lot of these issues that aren't permanent necessarily but if you go to rehab and then you go into outpatient treatment and you're only 30, 60, 90 days sober, you your brain may not have healed enough to really absorb all of this material that you're being given. So with that in mind, what is cognitive impairment? What do I what do I mean by that? And and how does it impact treatment? So I call cognitive impairment an umbrella term. It covers a lot of different issues. Obviously, intellectual and developmental disabilities, traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury, such as brain damage from overdose. And how many people do have you worked with who have had one or multiple overdoses and only survived because of Narcan? So, you know, every time that happens, there's there's potential damage being done to their brain. And then things like serious mental illness resulting in loss of cognitive functioning or a serious learning disability that interferes with the person's ability to acquire the knowledge or apply the knowledge that you're you're trying to give them. And of course, years of substance use resulting in loss of cognitive functioning how how frequent again this is an older term but you know they used to talk about things like wet brain you know that years of substance use can just destroy your brain so all of those factors combined uh and I saw I saw post acute withdrawal flash by. Yeah, you know, it can take a couple of years for for those symptoms to clear up. And part of it is your ability to think clearly. And then the last category would be these sort of undiagnosed issues. We don't really know. They don't have a diagnosis. 
but it's clearly evident that they struggle a little bit with their cognitive functioning. And that specifically is the area that we would call cognitive challenges or cognitive differences. And it's not to label someone. It's really from a functional standpoint that when you are looking at how a person is progressing or not progressing in treatment, if they are facing some cognitive challenges, it's important to recognize it and adapt your treatment approach to be more successfully successful, sorry, with them. So the CDC lists the signs of intellectual disability as issues with memory, understanding social rules, having trouble seeing the results of their actions, that great consequential thinking that we talk about all the time, and solving problems. So those are all skills that people in treatment and recovery really need to use in order to stay sober. With traumatic brain injuries, it's really more of a broad spectrum because depending on what part of the brain was injured, uh, it, it can result in so many different kinds of damage. But the ones that are relevant to this discussion include cognitive problems and also executive functioning problems. And again, these are those skills that people need to help them stay sober. How many people have you worked with who are always running a little late? They seem disorganized. They can never find their MRT book or whatever, you know, um, worksheet or something they were supposed to be working on. Um, you know, planning, decision making, all of those skills can be affected by a brain injury or, you know, other types of cognitive uh, issues. Again, mental illness, there's research that shows that cognitive functioning is moderately to severely affected in people with schizophrenia. And to make it worse, it's very common, but not often recognized or documented in the health or clinical setting. So one study showed that 60% of older adults with serious mental illness exhibited cognitive impairment, but it was only documented in 17% of their charts. And this is what I feel like we're dealing with in SUG treatment settings, is that there's a lot of people with cognitive challenges and it's just not recognized or documented. So how can you work with it? How can you treat it? How can you help a person if you don't even recognize that it's there? Uh, and also people with comorbid serious mental illness and cognitive challenges have higher healthcare costs. So in, the, in this other study, it was 61% of participants with serious mental illness exhibited cognitive impairment. And that was correlated to higher healthcare costs over time. So what does this all mean? The, what it boils down to in my mind is that people with cognitive challenges often have trouble learning, understanding, remembering, and or applying new information and skills. And isn't that really what the process of treatment is all about? Learning new information, understanding it, remembering it, and using it. So it makes it pretty difficult for treatment to be effective if there's any, uh, any roadblocks in this process. So I'm about to show you a handout. I want you to imagine that it's your first day in group and you are given this handout to discuss. And I'm gonna show it to you and I want you to think about, first of all, what's your first reaction to it, like thought-wise, and then what does it feel like to see this?
just want you to take a minute, you know, try to figure out like, what am I looking at? What is this? And what does that feel like? And if you want to start um, putting comments in the chat, um, we can we can start sharing them. So it looks like a foreign language. And what does it feel like to be given this? Imagine you are in group. It's your first day in treatment. And you get handed this thing and you're expected to talk about it. You know, what's that like? Yeah, very confusing, intimidating, overwhelming. Looking for context clues. Yes, that's a skill that some people don't possess or haven't developed because they've never really gotten the whole reading thing down very well. So yeah, we can look at the hecama within each person. Well, what is that? You know? <laughs> so I'm I'm seeing the responses go by. <laughs> Megan says, I think I'd try to find the exit. Yeah. This is the handout. And you'll recognize it, many of you will, from the DBT skills training handouts and worksheets. It's about wise mind, the balance between reasonable mind and emotion mind. And just for those of you who are curious, that was a foreign language, it was Swahili. Yes, it takes so long to decipher from, <laughs> who is this for, I quit. Uh, I chose Swahili uh, not only because I used to speak it pretty fluently, but I figured it wasn't a language that many people would recognize in this country. Um, you know, unless you happen to have come from Kenya or Tanzania or anywhere in that area. So these we'll talk about this later but um particularly dbt uses a lot of vocabulary that is a bit um higher level it's a little more intellectual it's kind of difficult and i have to admit that you know i i haven't been formally trained in DBT, but I've been exposed to a lot of these handouts and worksheets, and some of them are a little confusing to me, and I, you know, I'm trained as a counselor. So anyway, we'll talk about that later. But the, the whole point of that exercise is for you to kind of get a sense of what it might be like for someone coming into treatment who has some cognitive challenges and maybe doesn't even know it. That's, that's the hard part. They might not even realize that that's what's going on. So imagine all that confusion and the intimidation and feeling those expectations on you that you're supposed to understand this just like everybody else, you know? So that's a lot, that's a lot. And how does this affect treatment? There's two ways. They're kind of connected. There's those mechanisms of change that we rely on to help people move through, you know, the stages of change, right? So uh, if they don't engage in treatment or adhere to the treatment regimen, you know, they're not going to have as great outcomes. Uh, maybe they don't really get the insight that you're hoping to help them with they're not as ready to change and maybe more denial of their substance use disorder and lower self-efficacy. So these are all elements that are important for healthy change and it can have a uh, cognitive challenges can have a negative impact on them, which leads to, sorry, I got this from 
rapid cognitive screening of patients with substance use disorders, and what those mechanisms of change lead to is really poorer treatment outcomes, especially retention and abstinence. And those are really the, the major goals for most uh, treatment facilities. We want people to stay in treatment long enough to achieve their goals. And for a lot of people, that goal is abstinence. So, so let's talk a little bit about what this all looks like. How would you even notice this in a treatment setting? And think about that question. Is it behavior or is it cognitive challenges? I mentioned that word treatment resistance. Um, Sorry, my timer blacked out. There we go. Um, treatment resistance is a term that they used to use a lot with people who didn't like comply and just jump in and do everything they were told to do. But is it really that or could it be related to cognitive challenges? So. How do you, yes, Stacy just said that she worked with adolescents and the cognitive impairment often looked like behavior until you looked a little deeper and realized what was going on. So how would you define a uh, substance use disorder? What would a functional definition be for you? Anyone want to just throw something in the chat? How do you know that substance use be, is a problem for somebody? Leading to consequences. Okay. So if someone's use of a substance is causing problems, it's a problem. I mean, that's like, that's one of the most basic definitions of an issue that you can have, right? If, it, if it's affecting your ability to function, if you're having negative consequences, then it's a problem. And I like to look at this sort of functional level and we often encourage our clients or patients to look at this sort of functional level, you know, uh, to help them understand or be more accepting that it's an issue for them. So what are the signs of, yes, using despite consequences? What are the signs of a substance use disorder? Like what kind of changes might you see or how would you, uh, yeah, what kind of changes might you see in a person that would lead you to believe that maybe they have a substance use disorder? Mood changes, patterns of use, maybe some um, relationship, housing stability, yeah, uh, and maybe some health issues, right? So you might see physical changes in the person, depending on the drug they're using. You, you know, they could lose a lot of weight, or if they're using xylazine, they might have some of those sores on them. You see emotional changes, definitely, definitely, right? Moodiness or mood swings or uh, depression, anxiety, and behavioral changes, right? Facial outbreaks, yes. So the signs of, it, just in an objective, like observable way, there are changes in a person that lead you to believe or give you a sign that they're having a problem. And then there's the consequences. And a lot of people were listing those consequences to their physical and mental health, to relationships, to their responsibilities, and unexpected problems. Any kind of unexpected problem, but legal seems to be right up there. That's one of the big ones. 
So I, I'm hopeful that as we were going through that list and you were thinking about it, you sort of have a picture of a person, maybe sort of a generalized person in your mind of a person with a substance use disorder and how you could tell. But some of the signs and consequences can be different in a person with cognitive impairment. For example, living arrangements. Some people with cognitive challenges live with family or parents or, um, you know, someone who sort of has a supervisory role with them, or they might live in a group home or a residence of some kind. They might live in a supportive apartment or, you know, maybe they live in an independent apartment or maybe they're unhoused. And so, again, the, the sort of stereotypical picture or the expectation that you might have of someone um, with a substance use disorder, it might not look quite the same if it's a person with cognitive challenges because some of these things could mask the typical things that you would expect to see. Same with employment status. If a person is on disability and they're not working, they don't have, you know, they didn't just get fired. So you, you, that's one criteria that you don't have to help you ascertain whether that person has a substance use disorder or not. Uh, maybe they're working in supportive employment. So they kind of have enough supervision that they're able to keep functioning even though their use is escalating. Maybe they do work independently and what would that look like? Uh, and again, financial independence. Depending on how independent they are with their money and, you know, able to write checks or, you know, you handle their spending money, um, that could look differently when you're start when you're trying to pick up those signs and consequences of substance use so you, you almost have to kind of think outside the box a little bit and i'm sure oh somebody just asked if um someone with a diagnosis of ADHD would you consider that a cognitive impairment or a challenge and it ca definitely can be, uh, yes, especially if it's untreated, because if they've had, you know, if it's been a lifelong struggle for them and they've never learned how to manage it or, you know, if they've never been on medication to help manage it and they've developed all kinds of like really poor coping skills then yeah they come into treatment and they're kind of all over the place and have never learned how to focus or you know all of it they may not have done well in school so now they feel like they can't do this all this homework you know so we know the the criteria for substance use disorder right out of the dsm-5 i sort of shortened them here and when you're working with someone uh, who has a cognitive challenge you may not be able to see these as clearly as you might see with someone else for example you might ask someone how much do you drink or how often and they they really may not be able to tell you they may not have the freedom or money to use as much or as long as they want. So they might tell you, oh, I only have two beers a week, which doesn't seem like much. But if that's every penny they're able to scrape together, and if they didn't have an issue with money, they might have they might be drinking two, three beers a day. You know, so you have these are all things that you kind of have to think about. Um, they may have to get very creative in order to get their substance and may not understand what cravings are or be able to to really describe them or what an urge is um and again i mentioned this you know they may not have a job so is substance use adding to their inability to work we have to kind of figure that out 
And again, with relationships, how do you gauge the impact of substance use on someone who may have, you know, different kinds of relationships? Like if it's someone who is in a supportive apartment or a residence of some kind, they have staff around them. And those might be their closest relationships, even more so than family, because they see them all the time, they talk to them all the time. So how does substance use affect that relationship? And again, tolerance and withdrawal, those are the biggest indicators, right, of, of a problem. Um, yeah, uh, so diagnosing a substance use disorder in someone who has cognitive challenges is not as direct or forthcoming <laughs> as it might be for somebody else. So recognizing cognitive impairment in a clinical setting is very easy if you get a referral packet that says this person had a TBI, you know, okay, you kind of know what to expect. Uh, if you don't get that, it's a little more difficult. But if you know what to look for, there are signs that can be recognized and you kind of have to investigate. So a person with cognitive challenges may show limited comprehension, communication difficulties, both receptive and expressive. And sometimes there's a spike in one and not the other. So somebody may sound very verbal, you know, uh, and be very social. Hey, how you doing? And always saying hi to everybody and even remembering people's names. But they might not understand what you're saying to them to the same level that they can express. So it's when you have those differences that it really can become a challenge. Uh, shorter attention span, repetitive or stereotypic patterns of behavior, whether it's movements, speech, or topics. Did you ever know someone who always talked about the same topic or always brought up the same story? Every, every group, you know, um, that can be that sort of repetitive pattern. Difficulty with social cues and other social skills deficits. Or the challenges may be a little more subtle. So think about what literacy issues might look like from a functional standpoint or a behavioral standpoint. What about difficulty processing input or behavior stemming from emotional dysregulation? What, what might those things look like in a clinical setting? So if somebody has difficulty reading and writing or maybe they can't read or write at all, think about that handout, how do you think that might show up? They may just not want to participate or they may joke or laugh about it or, you know, put themselves down. They may seem to be embarrassed or really kind of blurt out inappropriate or, or one word answer, like incorrect answers. Um, or they may seem to be really manipulative trying to get out of the assignments. With processing input, um, that could be new information. Uh, oh, somebody said defensiveness. That's a good one too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, defensiveness bordering on um, aggression, you know, kind of making that shift. So yeah, frustration. So uh, with processing new information, that could be material that you're trying to teach them. It might be their own emotions or someone else's emotions or the experiences of others. If they have difficulty processing that, again, they may they may sort of make jokes, try to smooth things over, take things the wrong way, show kind of inappropriate emotions for the situation, like laughing when it's a serious conversation. Um, 
repeating statements or questions in a way that others might find annoying because, hey, we, you know, we just talked about this. Why are you asking again or repeating, you know, or uh, responding to material that was covered a while back after the group has already moved on? You know, people kind of laugh when someone doesn't get a joke right away and there's a period of time and then all of a sudden the person goes, oh, <laughs> you know, that was really funny. It can. It, that's kind of a not very nice example, but it can it can happen the same way for someone with cognitive challenges. You may have just talked about, uh, say, you talked about uh, denial, and then you move on and you start talking about acceptance, and they're still kind of working out the denial piece, and then, oh, like they're in the middle of talking about acceptance, but that person might say, oh, so you're saying that denial is blah, blah, blah. And the rest of the group is like, where have you been all this time? Then there are the behavior issues. Uh, lots of different um, challenges can contribute to behaviors or what are perceived as, you know, behavior problems. So if you have a really short attention span, you might interrupt or change the subject or blurt out responses or stand up or pace or, you know, be disruptive somehow. Uh, again, if uh, with the autism spectrum, um, these are kind of the more obvious um, things that you might notice, some sort of mimicking or repeating or rocking for eye contact. You know, those are kind of the classic symptoms that you think about, but also things like transitions. In that example I gave, when they moved on from denial to acceptance, someone on the spectrum might have a little bit of trouble making that transition. Or when this group is over and now it's time to go do that, you know, those transition times can be difficult. Um, boundary issues, both extremes, no boundaries at all, or extreme boundaries, and social cues. Um, they may not realize the body language they're giving off, or they might not understand other people's body language, nonverbal cues. They may interpret things absolutely literally. Um, or they may personalize what someone else is saying, even if it has nothing to do with them. So these are just a few examples. I mean, that's just four issues. And for every possible issue, there are signs or, or behaviors that you might see as a result. So uh, when you take into consideration that people with cognitive challenges need, uh, yeah, a little self-esteem, um, we need to kind of adapt or modify or, I don't want to use that really, but personalize. You know, we need to personalize the program for each person to meet them where they are, not just emotionally or in terms of readiness to change, but cognitively as well. So presenting problem. If you're doing how many, I don't know how many of you, if you want to just uh, use your raise your hand or something, but if you've done assessments before and the common first question is, what brings you here today? And you might get a long and complicated answer that has absolutely nothing to do with substance use. Or you might get a one word answer. Or you might get like, I don't know. <laughs> so it can be very difficult to ask this sort of open ended question. I see lots of hands raising. Um, when 
you might get this sort of very wordy, lengthy response, and it doesn't have anything to do with them or their substances. It's all about, you know, what happened to them. Or you might get someone who just says, I don't know why I'm here. I really don't, you know. Um, so the, this is all related to assessments. Sorry, I, I kind of skipped that part of the um, that introductory slide. If you're trying to get a substance use history and you ask someone, well, how old were you when you had your first drink? They might not be able to tell you an age, but if you can use reference points like school, you know, well, were you still in school when you, you know, or, um, or was it after you stopped going to school, you know, or was it middle school? Was it high school? You know, you can kind of try to help use life events to help them kind of narrow down um, ages. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, amount and frequency or progression, verbal, um, visual cues are very, very helpful for this because someone might not be able to really tell you how many beers they drank or how many, you know, how much weed they smoked a day. Um, so if you have some pictures and you use like a, just a seven day calendar, just drawn on a piece of paper, like what do you do on Mondays? And then, oh, okay. So after work, what do you do then? You know, and maybe I go bowling or, you know, and then what are the, you you kind of just have to help them figure out what are the days when they use and when they use how much you know and so you're looking at that issue of minimizing but it might not really be minimizing it might just be that they can't really tell you and same with consequences um, you might have to give examples of different kinds of negative consequences um to see what they relate to or what they can identify. Oh yeah, that happened to me. Or no, that didn't happen to me, but this happened. And then then it gets them kind of moving. Um, and same with other drugs. Um, depending on the person, they might not associate things as drugs or, um, oh yeah, uh, there was a comment there that uh, a client said they started after their mom died or, you know, after a big change happened. So, yeah, or trauma. We'll get to trauma later. Um, so you may need to help people figure out it, it, that maybe there were some other things they used that they don't know the name of or they didn't know um, what it was called, you know, whatever, or or that it even was a drug, you know, in some cases. So you can kind of, again, you can use pictures or you can just run different like street names past them until they, they seem to recognize something. With mental health and medical history, you may get very little information from the person. So you may have to rely on the referent and whatever documentation you can get submitted with the referral packet for things like diagnoses, medications, treatment history, names of current doctors, um, you know, you, those kinds of things. Um, I don't know how many people use a mental status exam during their admission assessment or when they do uh, um, maybe the psychosocial, but it, it, um, it can be very helpful and give you a lot of information about the individual. So things like a proverb. <laughs> so somebody said they're feeling very, very overwhelmed with all these questions and she does not have cognitive challenges. So I understand. Uh, they call it cognitive over uh, cognitive load, cognitive load, and 
you want to watch, like you can tell if someone's getting overloaded when their behavior starts to change or they seem to lose, you know, attention. But in a mental status exam, if you give a proverb, it can really tell you how concrete the person's thought process is. So something like, all that glitters is not gold. What does that mean to you? And if their thinking is very concrete, they might just literally, you know, take it very literally and say, well, you know, I, I made a, an art project with glitter, but that's not gold, you know, or I saw a shiny rock, but it wasn't gold. And they may not get to the nuance meaning of, you know, well, some things look great, but they're really not so great. So using something like that can, can really help you see where the person is coming from. Uh, often mental status exams look for short and long-term memory, and you can use words or you could use pictures for either of those, the, the long and the short term. The mood uh, range that is included on standard mental status uh, forms can be very extensive. And so if you're getting the sense that the person, you know, really isn't quite understanding all of it, you may want to simplify how many different feelings you're talking about and just stick to some of the basics or even use pictures, feelings, photographs to help uh, with understanding. Now, in New York, it was kind of mandatory, or not mandatory, but it was standard practice to use this instrument called the modified mini screen. And you're supposed to ask the questions exactly as written or have them do it themselves, self-administer it, and they read these questions. So some of the issues you might have are vocabulary because these are actually some of the words they use intensely anxious frightened uncomfortable or uneasy or unwanted distasteful inappropriate intrusive or distressing so you know that's vocabulary that not everyone and even people who don't necessarily have a diagnosed cognitive impairment they're just words that you know might not be very familiar to the person Again, references to time. They ask, in the past two weeks, have you experienced blah, 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 or in the past month, or, you know, and if you have difficulty with understanding time, you might not know how to answer that. And again, with the amounts and frequency, frequency excessively, most of the time, repeatedly. So, Uh, yes, somebody said some clients have English as a second language issue as well. And that's that's another whole layer to, to this issue. Um, so we all know that the DSM criteria are a must have or must use for diagnosing SUD because the insurance companies want it, you know, the state governing boards want it, all that stuff. So one of the best things you can do to help you assess those criteria, the first thing is to use visual aids and things like pictures of substances. And you'll notice there's just one beer. And if you print out on a little piece of paper, one beer, and you make 50 copies of it, you can keep adding beers until the person kind of feels like, oh yeah, okay, that's about how many I would have at a time or in a night or whatever. And the second one with the, si uh, the sizes, somebody might say, oh, I only have two beers, but they're the, you know, um, 40 ounce, what are those things called? Natty daddies, which are really high alcohol content, you know? Uh, 
or, you know, different kinds of liquor, or there's a marijuana joint there, there's a pill, you know. So you can use those uh, types of pictures to help the person identify what it is they're using and how much. And then things like clocks. Um, digital clocks seem to work a little better than analog, although some people do know how to tell time on an analog watch. But if you print out one through 12, you know, you can talk about PM, AM, whatever. You can just pick out the different numbers that you want to use and see what time of day it is that they were uh, using or what have you. Morning, afternoon, night. If you could find one that was like evening or maybe after work, you know, that would be helpful. A calendar. And as I said, just something even no numbers or anything, just Monday through Sunday. And lots of space to write what they do on those days that that can be really helpful. And then those feeling spaces or symptoms of withdrawal, uh, hangover or headache or shakes or um, Uh, um, I don't know if you saw that comment, but that person was saying they're a, um, an art therapist. And <laughs> yeah, this is where you can really use that image process to um, Oh, yes, that's a good point. Um, you You do need to be mindful of what might trigger someone in terms of the substances. So uh you kind of it's something you have to kind of test out carefully and again gauge for that uh overload or you know a, a triggered response um and you can always ask um what you know if looking at pictures would be upsetting to them before you start just throwing pictures of drugs at them. So yeah, uh, I'm just realizing that I'm never gonna get through all this material if I don't kind of speed it up a little bit. So um, the other, I'm just gonna try to keep it moving. Um, another strategy is to ask questions to help people remember or describe. So did you ever try to stop? What happened? Did you ever try to think of a way to, to make sure you didn't use too much? You know, like only buying one or whatever. How do you get your substance? Oh, sorry. Hold on one minute. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Uh, and cravings, you know, do you ever start thinking about something and then you can't stop thinking about it until you get some? So if, uh, yes, using substance alone or in a group, all of those kinds of things, you, you may need to ask questions to help them remember or describe what their typical pattern is. Um, and then the third one is to break items down. You ask one question at a time about friends or arguments or, you know, all those different things, but try not to like throw them all uh, at the person, kind of stick to one question at a time. And, um, And then kind of when you finish that question, you can say, oh, yeah, OK. So what about, you know, arguments? Did you ever get any in any arguments with anybody? Oh, who'd you get into an argument with? You know, and then relationships and then, you know, forgetting things like just kind of take them one at a time, because if you just ask what kinds of social problems have you had, they might not know. 
Uh, similarly, get information in stages. So what kinds of things do you like to do? Oh, have you been doing those things lately? Oh, like that. You're not doing it as often? Oh, well, why do you think you stopped? You know, so uh, piece it together. And withdrawal, again, you just want to be descriptive. You don't want to say, uh, you know, have you ever had withdrawal? You want to say, like, do you ever wake up feeling sick? Or have you ever had any of those symptoms of withdrawal from whatever drug it is that they're using? And with psychosocials, this is really kind of your strategy for the whole assessment. Get as much history as you can, use what you have, and ask questions to fill in the blanks. Avoid asking yes or no questions because the person may just yes you or no you the whole time, especially if they don't really understand. So you can try sort of open ended questions, but if they really can't answer them, you might offer two or three choices about what it is that you're asking. And I realize that that may seem to run completely opposite of what your training is, that when you're doing an assessment, you want the person to tell you. But if you're working with someone with a cognitive challenge, the only way it, it could be that the only way you can help them explain to you where they're coming from is if you kind of lead them, not, you know, not like in a court where you're asking leading questions, but, you know, you give someone choices and help them kind of narrow it down. And while you're doing this, you want to look for the things that really motivate the person whether it's relationships, activities, hobbies, pets, things that they like, things that they don't like, and kind of store that away because you can use that when you're doing your treatment plans or you know, um, figuring out goals and that sort of thing. Uh, and those literacy, life skills, and social leisure questions that a lot of people just skip over, they're very important for this, um, for people with cognitive challenges. Because those are things you're going to have to actually teach and reinforce and have them practice where other people wouldn't necessarily need that um, as part of their treatment. So uh, you may need to have shorter sessions and do it in one or two sessions at a time. Uh, Again, oh, and yeah, the trauma piece, like you want to know ahead of time as much as possible if the person has any history of trauma. And as you going through the assessment to really watch for changes that could indicate uh, a trauma response. So if somebody says, I don't want to talk about that, that's fine. If they, you know, um, need to get up for a minute or whatever, that's fine. Um, and you can always get more information from your referent or a family member um, to help fill in the blanks. So with treatment plans, um, oh gosh, there, there is so much information here. Um, do you write cookie cutter treatment plans or are they really individualized? So, you know, they run from not person-centered at all, the first three goals come right out of the admission assessment and it's the same three goals that every client gets, you know, maintain abstinence, comply with legal orders, you know, whatever, um, come to treatment, you know, uh, or, you know, is a little more personalized or does your electronic health record have like check boxes or drop downs that you can choose from, uh, you know, and, and you kind of get a little more personalized. Uh, maybe you talk to the person about their goals, but then you write the whole thing by yourself or um, do you really, what, why did that happen? 
do you, are you completely person centered where you make a unique treatment plan for that person? And I've been on that journey myself to, you know, to really become more individualized and person centered. So I hate to do this, but I'm going to skip all this person centered care guidance. There's some really great words in here. I love them. I highlighted them and you can read them when you're when you print out your your slides because uh I could take another whole hour on this part um but this is New York's um philosophy on person centered care person centered treatment and using the person centered approach can be difficult for people with cognitive challenges because of various factors like being completely externally focused, not recognizing, you know, their own problems, um, not being able to identify what they want or their values, like they might not even know what a value is. So you really have to become a detective. You have to get creative and help people sort of i use the term drilling down um narrowing or focusing in on to, really to find the heart of the problem and that may take longer in terms of time and it may have to be much more directive than you might be with someone else but this is where those motivating factors come in because as you're writing your treatment plan, you can use those motivating factors to help them reach their objectives or uh, just to keep them engaged in treatment. So uh, our job is supposed to be to guide and reframe and raise discrepancies, all those nice motivational interviewing things, uh, offer compassion and translate that to a plan of action that the person recognizes as their own even though you've changed their words a bit you want them to really see themselves in that plan and we do that with everybody to a certain extent at least i hope we do but with someone with cognitive challenges you just have to take it to that next level so with goal planning keep it simple you know, it used to be that we were mandated by our agencies to have a goal for every, uh, what did they call them, living area or whatever, you know, so you had your substance use, you had your mental health, you had your physical health, you had social and family and education and vocation, and you had to have goals in each of those areas. New York has gone the other direction. They're saying, keep it simple. For the beginning, just pick one goal and one or two steps that can get you there. So uh, again, there's, there's so much more. I love these words, they're great, but you can read them afterwards. Um, recovery supports, right? Everyone is, really big on uh, peer advocates and recovery coaches and people with cognitive challenges can really benefit from getting connected with a recovery coach. It's like gold. It's so good. Um, Strength-based, obviously. Um, Non-punitive, definitely. So, One goal is a start for change in behavior. Exactly. So this is a statement. This is actually a statement that I, uh, a client said to me. Everyone is mad at me. My family is mad at me and I keep getting in trouble. I try to talk to them, but they don't understand me. And when I ask them to explain what they are saying, they change the subject or tell me not to worry about it. But I do. This person had a lot of anxiety. So how do you reframe that? You want to understand your family. You want them to understand you. You don't give up even when you're frustrated and you know when to walk away to cool off. Those are all great strengths, you know, and you start from there and you you build on that. So 
we were going to have some questions here, but I have like no more time and I still have some important things to get to. So Marla, I don't know if you want me to just kind of keep trying to chug through or what you want to do. Um, I would say if you have more information, you can keep going and at 3.30, if you are free to stick around for a little bit for questions, then we can have folks ask questions if they have any, but I don't want to cut you off if you still okay. have. Okay, and uh, I absolutely have more time. Um, I can keep going as long as you all want to stick around, but I understand if you can't you know if you have some uh, a session coming up or something i i completely understand but i will stay here as long as you are willing to listen <laughs> so let me just keep going this is kind of the meat and potatoes here um yes it will be archived later so if you can't stay you can always jump in and and pick up where you left off um great yeah so these are the generalized approaches to developing a modified program. When you have a, a new client who has cognitive challenges, it's really important to welcome them into the program and you know, try to help them have a positive experience on that first day, because that's really tough for everybody. But somebody with cognitive challenges, if they have a bad experience that first day, they may not have the ability to say, okay, I, I, it, that was bad, but I'm just going to, I'm going to try again and I'm going to keep going. You know, they may just say, nope, that was bad. I'm not going back, I'm not doing that. So some things to keep in mind, again, you may have to be more directive than you would be with other people. You need to really uh, clearly state the rules and expectations and reinforce them regularly. If possible, you want to review or create group rules with both words and images and post them in the group room. Um, if someone frequently breaks a rule, do not assume it is intentional or with malicious intent until you are certain they understand what the rule means and that they're capable of following it. You don't want to set someone up for failure. If you think about someone with ADHD and you know you're asking them to sit still for an hour or you know however long like the session, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, um, you know, you really have to make sure that the person is capable of following the rule and that they understand it before you start. Uh, trying to call them on it, you know. So think about that for a second. Um, what are your expectations? What are the expectations of a traditional treatment setting? Oftentimes when they, when you get your handout, you know, it has patient uh, rights and patient responsibilities. So what do you think what do you think of as those patient responsibilities? What do you expect people to be able to do when they come into treatment? If you want to write some out or punctual attendance. Things like you're expected to do your assignments. Uh, Total abstinence, thank you, honesty, uh, participating group, express your feelings appropriately, um, you know, right? All of those things. Um, so we may have some expectations or assumptions that yeah, don't cross talk that we we don't even realize are way too high for someone 
with cognitive challenges. So we have to kind of think at a different level. Things like we have that expectation for somebody to sit for however long, you know, the group lasts. If they're in a day rehab program and they're there for four hours, you know, yes, you take breaks and stuff, but the expectation is that you sit there the whole time. You read and do worksheets or homework. You maybe watch movies and you have to sit and you have to pay attention and then you have to talk about it afterwards. Stay on topic. You identify and express feelings appropriately. Display appropriate emotions and respond empathetically to others. That's a tough one. Um, grasp material at the same speed as the rest of the group. Ask appropriate questions like on the current topic or on a general substance abuse topic at all, you know, like, so appropriate questions. Um, so we, we really have to kind of change how we think about our expectations of people and not just apply that sort of um, one size fits all, you know, those rules that we just expect everybody can handle. Um, now, in terms of progress, it may take a lot longer to make that connection with the person. Um, so it's really important that the person isn't like bounced around from primary to primary, if at all possible. Now, if you give it a chance with one counselor and it's really not working, then yeah, absolutely, it's time to find someone that they can connect with better. Once that trust is established, that person may show a really strong preference for one staff member. And issues of transference kind of need to be addressed. I don't know, here I say delicately, but again, you kind of have to think differently about transference, transference issues with someone with cognitive challenges. And the person may not appear to be making progress, but lack of progress should not be a reason to discharge the person. Expect that it will take a lot longer and just stay focused on their strengths and the small steps. So, Again, um, in the beginning, we talked about people with cognitive challenges face issues with learning, understanding, remembering, and applying. So how do you set up a treatment approach that's going to help people be more successful and overcome these challenges? The first one, learning. Yes, time is very important. Um, break down the concepts into smaller chunks and, and build on those little pieces. You know, once, once they get the first piece, then you add something new. And the more complex the concept, the more, the smaller the chunks have to be. Um, interactive, as interactive as possible uh, is important role plays, behavioral rehearsal, you know, you really got to get them involved in it because some people learn, what do they call that, kinesthetically, you know, they learn by moving and doing and so that's important. Um, visual aids, pictures, icons, graphs, charts, definitely. And how you present. I, I'm like a very uh, animated person. I make a lot of faces and uh, it's terrible for candid pictures because I always come out looking, you know, really strange. Um, but with my, with, you know, when I run a group, um, I can really play that up. If I'm trying to convey an emotion or, um, you know, just really anything, your facial expressions, your body language, your gestures can really help um, solidify the learning. Direct and immediate feedback is really important. And sometimes you have to, especially in a group, you have to 
make a decision between do I interrupt the group to correct this issue? Um, or do I wait until afterwards? And sometimes you really need to do it in the moment, not to be like punitive or to call them out or embarrass them, but even just to very, very briefly just say, you know, remember our rule about crosstalk or, you know, whatever it is, because you're trying to help the person make that connection. And really cover all bases. Um, <clears throat> the more different approaches you can take and different uh, ways you can cover the same subject um, and, you know, making it more fun uh, and modeling that desired behavior. Uh, for understanding, you want to watch out for vocabulary and check for understanding. So we might be talking about withdrawal and, and you can just look at somebody and kind of say, so what is it again? What is withdrawal? You know, like, like you want them to tell you, you know, like, cause you forgot. Uh, or what do you think serenity means in the serenity prayer? You know, um, and I do this a lot. In fact, I've done this so much. Uh, yeah, a thumbs up or head shaking. Yeah. Um, I did this so much in my work that sometimes I use, I did this with my family members or my coworkers, you know, oh yeah, that's called a trigger, you know, something that makes you want to use. And people would look at me like, um, I think I know that, Julia. <laughs> but it, it just becomes how you interact, you know, how you present your material. So it just became a habit to me. Um, examples, pictures, stories, the pace. See, now I am I was going nice and slow in the beginning and I ran out of time. So now I'm like, ugh. Um, and so you, you know, co really complex concepts. You, you may have to slow things down quite a bit and have more of those checks for understanding. How are you doing? Is everybody following along, you know? Uh, and if you are using material, handouts, something that is, has already been made, um, break it down. Just because a handout has, um, okay, bye, Corey. Um, just because a handout is, you know, two-sided and it's one topic, so you want to cover it in one group, it doesn't mean you have to do that. You can take the first concept and cover that in one group. And then next week, cover the next part. You know, you can finish a handout in as many weeks or days as it takes. So if someone doesn't understand, they may not be able to tell you that they don't understand. So you may see some changes or uh, an increase in stuff that doesn't really seem related. Uh, they may start to get agitated. And if you say, you know, is everything okay? And they may say, oh yeah, I'm just mad at, you know, something else. <clears throat> because they, they haven't made that connection that like they're not quite grasping it and it's frustrating to them. Um, <laughs> they may get sleepy. I can't tell you how many groups I've done where I tried to present something that was really complex and I didn't break it down enough. And within five minutes, all but one or two of the people in the group were out. Um, you know, just snoring practically because, <laughs> and it's not a reflection on them. It's my job to present the material in a way that they can understand. And Falling asleep is a clear sign that they're just, it's not, you know, they're not getting it. Um, changing the subject. Becoming fidgety. Making jokes. You know, here's a great example. How many people are familiar with the trans theoretical model or the stages of change? Um, we know 
these stages, right? Yeah, people are raising their hands. So we have pre-contemplation and contemplation and preparation, action, maintenance, relapse. And we're supposed to meet the person where they are in this cycle and um, move forward from there. And it does accept that recurrence is a possible stage, but progress is you know, made in a spiral. So if you do have a recurrence, you don't have to go all the way back to square one. If you don't understand what those words mean, what is pre-contemplation, you know? So I made up this very simplified version. Pre-contemplation is just, no, I don't have a problem. I'm not thinking about it and I'm not, I don't even want to talk about it. And then maybe, well, you know, maybe people are telling me I have a problem. I don't know, maybe I do. Um, okay. You know, what can I do about it? Where can I get help? And then treatment is due, right? I'm in treatment. I'm making those changes and keep. I'm I'm done now with the first part of my treatment. And now I want to keep going. I want to keep what I've learned. Uh, I want to go to aftercare or my meetings and um, or maybe some sort of step down in their treatment. And of course, relapse now. You know, these these slides are a little old. I'll have to remake them because we don't use relapse anymore. We use recurrence or resuming use. Uh, but most of the clients that I've worked with understand the word relapse. They know what it means. So I didn't really, I, I suppose I could say go back or something. It, it, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll do that. Remembering. You really have to know your client because some people have really good short-term memory and terrible long-term or vice versa. And so, you know, you kind of have to know what you to expect from each person. Um, it's really boring to just keep saying the same things over and over. So mix it up, try and find as many different ways to teach the same information some reading, some discussion, some worksheets, a game, role plays, you know, whatever you can think of using that same information, but just presenting it in a different way. And sometimes if you have a group member who's like, oh, I've heard this a million times, I'm so, have them present it, have them lead the discussion. It gives them a sense of self-efficacy and, and, you know, and pride and, and, Often the the clients will be really supportive and say, "Wow, you know," and and they'll join the discussion. Where if it's just me, they you know they might not get as involved. So, um, and then applying and generalizing. Uh, you've all heard of state dependent learning. I hope it applies here because if you learn stuff and practice it practice those skills in the clinic, um, uh, they may not be able to use it at home. You know, once they leave the clinic, they may not be able to apply it. So and the, and the other thing is some of our clients really don't have any sober socialization skills or leisure skills. Um, They've just never learned how to socialize or they've never been exposed to enough things to find something that they enjoy. They really don't know how to have fun, you know? So, and that's, that goes for people of all different cognitive levels. You know, if you, if, if you're treating someone in their fifties, who's been using since they were 12, you know, they may not have any of these skills. So. Um, you want to like use those teachable moments. So something happens in group and you say, oh, this is a great example of what I was talking about, you know, and you, you kind of explain, you know, so-and-so said this, and then the other person said that, and that's kind of what happens sometimes, right? You're, you know, you're out, you just like apply it, you generalize it to the real world. 
Um, same with role plays. If you're practicing a phone call, if you're calling your sponsor, have them hold a phone, you know, <laughs> really call someone. Um, and using this, the 12 step tools, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, and just keep reminding people that this is why we need to practice over and over, you know, and we just try to find as many different ways as we can. So with evidence-based practices, I have a whole bunch of them in here. Um, uh, these are all really commonly used, you know, popular, uh, effective evidence-based practices. And um, I, I'll just try to go through them really briefly. We know, I hope you know with motivational in interviewing that these are the techniques you're supposed to use. Um, and remember that resistance is really not the client's problem. It's an indicator of a counselor problem. The same way as if you put everyone to sleep, you know, it's something you're doing, it's not them. Um, so those techniques, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, summarizing, uh, they're all, they're all really great. Um, they're all really great tools or techniques. So how do you adapt them? Uh, one thing is to, again, make sure your, your language level is appropriate. So you want to ask kind of concrete questions, avoid why, because who knows why people do anything they do. Uh, and, you know, use short sentences and simple language. Start questions with a query word. What happens if you do this? Where do you go when this happens? You know, just very, you know, simple, concrete. Uh, and again, adjust to cognitive abilities. Try not to overload the person. Ask them one question at a time. Help them to not only verbalize feelings, but sometimes, you know, the person needs help to label, to name their feelings. So, you know, kind of help them with that and use those affirmations. And it's important for the staff to be trustworthy, to really engage, um, be accepting, have empathy, and be honest. And that came from a, a study uh, done by a group uh, through a grant from the National Institutes of Health. We know cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Our thoughts, our feelings, our behavior, or they're all intertwined. Um, people coming into treatment often have really negative thinking. Uh, and those pillars of CBT, it's meant to be a short-term process. It uses functional analysis, skills training, and cognitive distortions. So how do you modify CBT? First of all, you need a longer time frame. A 12-week group is not really going to be enough. Um, so you incorporate these strategies into the longer-term treatment. Um, a lot of psychoeducational groups, addiction education, attitudes, tools, thinking, mindfulness. Um, I could run educational groups all day, every day, and uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's really helpful. And then when you start doing your more process-oriented groups, you know, your actual group therapy, um, you've given the person a vocabulary and a framework to talk about what's going on for them. But if they don't have all this background education, they may not really be able to share in the same way that somebody else could. Uh, consequences, I love this, catching yourself. 
you really have to, and it, it it's part of mindfulness. You know, you have to catch yourself doing those old behaviors. Um, risk reduction, uh, stinking thinking. So in groups, we often do worksheets together. We do a lot of role playing. We play a lot of bingo, Jeopardy, card games, thumb balls. Uh, pull a topic from a bag. I have a basket full of bags that are full of little slips of paper that have things on them for I statements or, you know, different feelings, triggers, anger, triggers, all kinds of things. Um, again, the visual aids, the icons, the symbols, rehearsing behavior. Uh, sorry, that last one, drawing and illustrating key points and skills. I, as the art therapist said, you know, the, the, getting the person involved in drawing or coloring in even uh, an illustration that relates to the topic somehow can really help them remember it. Now, DBT is uh, a special form of CBT that's intended to be a longer term process, right? So it was developed to address borderline personality disorder and chronically suicidal individuals, but it's been found to be very effective. And the areas it, it focuses on are emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, mindfulness, and increasing distress tolerance. Um, and so it's, a, it's effective with a lot of different um, issues, but the original DBT work is very complex and uses a lot of vocabulary that can be very challenging. So there is a woman named Julie F. Brown. So we have the same initials, same first name, it's very ironic. Um, she developed a book called The Emotion Regulation Skills System for Cognitively Challenged Clients. She took DBT and boiled it down and created a system to apply those emotion regulation skills um, for people of all cognitive levels. I recently did the training for this um, book, and I'm using it right now in um, the program I work in now is um, an alternative to incarceration, and I do a lot of the educational groups for that, and I'm, I'm running a group with this. And these are people who are not labeled cognitively challenged or anything, but having this sort of simplified approach, um, makes it so much easier to understand and use. It's not intimidating. It's like, oh, it's very logical. It's like, oh, of course you want to do it that way, you know? Um, so I highly recommend looking into that. Um, Julia, then, yeah. um, just since we, it is 345 now, and just since we have had some people drop off, I just wanted, uh -huh. um, since we did want to have some time for questions, did we sure. want to? open that up just in case absolutely absolutely still on wanted to yep and somebody yep. did somebody mentioned doing a part two and i know you and i had talked about that offline mm -hmm. offline earlier mm -hmm. so maybe anything that's in these last couple slides that you um haven't gotten to perhaps mm -hmm. we could do that in a part two absolutely Which in fact i think all of the like that last half of um general approaches and the evidence-based practices, I could I could really do that um, a lot more slowly and- Yeah, that would be great. Detail, we so. actually, we have April open and we could do June as well. So I'll follow up with okay. you um, after that or after sure. this, but um, mm -hmm. if anybody did have any questions um, for Julia before we hop off here, um, please, Please put those in the chat now. And I, again, sorry we had to uh, cut off a little bit short. But... You no, know, once I got started, I just couldn't stop. Uh, David does. David wanted to know how many slides were left. 
there are probably i don't know 15 or 20. okay uh, it's the it's all those other evidence-based practices um including trauma-informed and um what else is in there um, yeah that took a I, I, off the top of my head i um Oh, will you be getting the slides by email? Yes, so the slides will be emailed out to everybody. You're going to get an email as soon as this is over that's already been scheduled, but I'll, since I already have the slides, I'll actually just follow up today um, with everyone who attended with these slides. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, the recording and the slides will be available on our website within the next week. Great. Um, and I, I really, I apologize for, um, oh, it is it's a very totally good job okay. of tearing down all this stuff. I tried to no, do the, it's, the basic, it you know, was, fan, it was so fantastic much. information. I learned so much. Everybody seems to really appreciate the conversation that was happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we will be excited to have you back for sure. Um, I okay. just. Uh, I just didn't want too many people to fall off before we sure. left an opportunity for any. Sure. Yeah, questions. I can't really see how many people are left, so <laughs> you know better. Yeah, than we, me. we've lost about half since yeah. we stopped around three thirty. But um, yeah. well, for the folks that are still here, since no other questions are coming in, I'm just gonna right. end with a few of these housekeeping items. And then, like I said, Julia and I will follow up offline about doing a part two, since this was such a great webinar and so many people are have voiced interest in a part two. Um, but uh, thanks so much to everyone for their questions. Uh, yes, there will be a certificate for this training. Um, we'd like to remind all participants that a PDF of today's webinar with the recording of today's presentation will be uploaded to the webinar library located on IRETA's website sometime next week. Once we have these resources posted, a link will be sent to all of today's webinar registrants. I want to remind you all of our evaluation and CEU process. You will receive a follow-up email from us. It will include a link to the evaluation and the second, and um, as well as step-by-step -step instructions for how to obtain your CEUs. Please note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to become available because we have to cross-check your attendance records. We would like to request that you fill out our evaluation. It should take no more than two minutes of your time. Again, we want to thank everyone for taking your time out, for taking time out of your day to participate if you have any questions at all, please email us. The email address is info at irata.org. And with that, we will conclude this webinar and check your email for uh, when Julia will be joining us for part two. Terrific. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for staying.